Hey, I'm Susanna Lanier, actor and acting coach for over 25 years. I'm Jess Greenberg, casting director for over 10 years. We're here to help you navigate this crazy, creative, and sometimes chaotic journey into the film and television world. We share our insights as to what works. And invite some pretty spectacular guests to share more ideas to move you on your journey. So without further ado, let's get into the show. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Holly Goche Frankel. Holly has graced us with her talent for 30 years. She is an actor, singer, burlesque dancer, award winning voice artist, and voice director. Welcome. And thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Hello. That's, hello. That's <laughs> a lot of things and many years, and it's weird when you hear it. It's back. a lot. <laughs> it, because we, you know, been doing the podcast a while and people say, if you're going to stay in Montreal, diversification, you know, and I was like, look at Holly. I mean, she's not fooling around. Like, she does <laughs> no. it all, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, everything except math. I'm <laughs> <laughs> all business. Uh, no, that's not true. I'm getting better. Um, but yeah, I, yes, thank you. So for those people who don't know, <laughs> and I actually, I actually didn't know too, how early you actually started working in this industry, but you were seven when you got like your first like paying wow. gig. Um, I started going into studio. I mean, it, ostensibly I, we could say earlier because I, I sort of grew up in the studios with my mom who was, is a singer. Um, and, uh, my dad was a drummer. He's still alive, but he does not drum anymore. Mm -hmm. They were studio musicians, which is something that you don't really talk or hear about anymore because there's no music and commercials that needs to be done live. But yeah, there was a whole coterie of, uh, backup singers who would do radio commercials and jingles for, radio right. stuff. and so when they all had kids in the late seventies, early eighties, they were like, hey, we've got lots of cereal and hot dog commercials and <laughs> all kinds of stuff that kids would be great on. And so studio was my babysitter. Like there was an old studio on uh, on Charlevoix down in Prince St. Charles called Tempo at the time. And now I think it's modulations. I think it's still there, which is remarkable. But there was a little drawer that had weird toys in it and knickknacks and a cribbage thing. Oh, you know, just stuff. And that's what I would play with. I, I was three, uh, possibly even younger, two, three. We've got pictures of me in diapers, like in that studio. So I know that I was in, I was immersed in the world of showbiz from birth. <laughs> I came out, I yeah. came out tap dancing, ready to go. But yeah, seven. Dancing. And then on the English side, I don't really know how it all transpired but i suppose after voice work and being exposed to studios probably somebody said hey you know she could try dubbing uh and that was i believe around nine but my first big gig was 10 years old uh dubbing wow, wow. yeah yeah because <laughs> i was good at reading and i was i understood uh something about that weird alchemy so yeah and then after that it just uh that was what I did. That was what I did uh, after school, sometimes during school. Um, <laughs> I started auditioning for film and TV when I was 10 as well. And I don't, uh, I don't think I've ever really stopped. I've taken some little breaks, but I, that's, yeah, that's a long time. I'm 44 wow. now. And so, wow. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. good to know. So you've been dubbing for 34 years. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So anyone who's like, well, she's so good at it. I'm like, it's yeah. not fair. I've done the, the 10,000 hours plus and it's, I'm not a fair example. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's because that's exactly what uh, somebody told me. The best dubber in the city is Holly Gochi Frankel. And I'm like, <laughs> wow. But now you told me you've been doing it for 34 years. So it's nice yeah. to know that you worked at it. It wasn't just like, I'm in studio and here I go killing it. So that's it. And know. I mean, you know, yeah. there are people out there who have done it and that's kind. Thank you. I don't know who said that, but it's kind of them. I learned from people who were doing it for much longer than me, you know, like Kathleen Fee and Richard Dumont and Mark Camacho and Thor Bishop yeah. and, you know, Maria Bircher, all those people, they were already there. <laughs> I mean, you know, they were 
some of them joke with me. They're like, yeah, we weren't even finished school when you were already dubbing. And <laughs> I mean, I can't, you know, whatever. But but yes, I, I was right up there with people who had had a wealth of experience. And those were my teachers. Those were the people that I was literally in studio spaces with. And, and I watched them all get directed. And it was, that was the process. You just sat and you watched and uh, you learned through osmosis. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. So what did you study in school? So yeah, in school, I, I mean, I kind of went to regular old elementary and high school, but I had a passion for musicals. Um, you know, my parents being whimsical child adults who were very into, you know, Wizard of Oz and, and, and MGM musicals and lots of flash. And I was like, yes, this me want to do that. So I started, you know, tap jazz and ballet when I was four and that persisted. I took a break when I was eight from dance because I broke my leg (laughs) Um, trying, trying to be sporty on roller skates. And then that was a bust. (laughs) But yeah, I, I was always studying dance and not so much singing until my late teens. I started doing more voice lessons because I was already singing and it was sort of that strange thing that became a bit alienating later on where, you know, you're, you're doing it professionally. So why, you know, I mean, I learned that training was, was a gift and a, and a privilege and an important part of how I could hone things. But yeah, so I always studied um, just boring old stuff at school, but I loved English, you know, fantasy stuff and storytelling and writing. I was always wanting to write stuff. And that's what I thought I would do when I went to university. I was, uh, I went to, I went into English literature, which is a guaranteed money making a degree, really, right? really, really <laughs> a great degree to get for money. Uh, and, um, and women's studies. So my feminism was already activated, uh, pretty much into my, my early teens. Interesting. So that's why you didn't pursue theater. You were thinking more of a career in writing. Is that what I was? Yeah. You know, writing and <laughs> I'll say it because I feel it's a safe space. I wanted to be poet. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> whatever. That's gorgeous. Whatever yeah. that means. Yeah. So I went, <laughs> I went into poet. I was like, I did a lot of poetry and then philosophy. Initially I had wanted to do philosophy. I was, just, I mean, I've always been a seeker. I think that's something that's been in me already. And, and yeah, at the time I made a choice because I was doing so much dubbing and I was already auditioning for, for professional acting gigs in university. How old is that? Like 21 years old. So yeah, I was, I, I looked into professional theater programs in Montreal and I was terrified because all of them said, you basically have no extracurricular time. You have no life. You will not do anything. You, some of them explicitly said you can't have a job. Yeah. And I I was already living out of my house. Like I had moved out at 19 and I was supporting myself fully just with voice acting gigs. So yeah, I entered into university thinking it would be this great creative spark and it, it completely undid me intellectually it was not a creative university it was you know really academic and it was for academia it was to become a professor and I felt very intimidated and and that was sort of yeah like pretty demoralizing after the end of it because I didn't write I didn't put pen to paper almost no journal entries even for like four years after I graduated I was super dead (laughs) from the lack of Uh, creativity. I probably would have been better off going to a place like Concordia or something. But I, I also realized like, I'm not sure school is for me. I liked the structure uh, Mm because I grew up a bit, a bit in chaos, but I liked, I liked having a structured thing. And then I, after that, I always regretted not going to theater school. So I, then I had a a healthy chip on my shoulder about not having completed theater school training and only doing things uh, in my own spare time, extracurricularly doing private lessons, which again is super privileged. And I didn't know anything in my twenties. I was like, I took a lot of stuff for granted. Um, and I, but I thought, Oh, I'm not good enough because I didn't get to do this, this kind of fame school. I wanted to go to fame school. I really wanted right. to have that, you know, <laughs> that's what I wanted. And yeah. I, I dabbled, I dabbled at McGill. I did musicals. Uh, I did some like operettas. So that's yeah. when I started studying opera, singing. And I, I, 
I wanted to sort of know about everything, but every time I would meet a teacher, they would be really into it and it's okay, you're going to, you're going to do this. And they wanted to kind of define me and say, okay, this is the only thing you must do now. It was the same as theater school. It was like, you must only do theater. And I was like, yeah, but I don't only do theater. I don't want to only do theater. And I mean, I love, I love musical theater. While we're still talking about like, I guess like your younger ages, like I get a, asked all the time by parents, like, how do I get my kids into the industry? And <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have yeah. the same reaction. And I just like, I don't understand how to make people understand. First of all, yes, your kid is cute. <laughs> Will mm-hmm. that make them famous? Who knows, you know? Yeah. But also it's like the amount of time and training and dedication it takes it's a full-time job for a parent, but also like the emotional side, how you were saying how it completely affected you. You have to know your kid and you have to know yourself as a parent of they will face so much rejection. Like how do I have the tools to handle that for myself and for them? Mm-hmm. So like, that's a, you know, that's a good way of, of doing it. I don't get approached often um, by parents. I don't, I don't, have kids. So I'm not always in those milieus. I do meet more kids now in, in dubbing realms, but I'm very reticent to give, you know, child focused classes because my main question, if you get approached by a parent would be why, why do you want your child exposed to this industry? It doesn't matter. You know, like you might be in the industry too. So why is it for money? (laughs) Is it for their college fund? Is that something you've discussed with them? Is it something they're saying? You know, I know, I know people now who are doing it right, but I know so many people who do it wrong. If you're responsible and you help your kid navigate performativity and people mm-hmm. pleasing and yeah. expectation and yeah. rejection, but yeah, you better make damn sure that you're ready to navigate that with them emotionally all the time. Um, and check in with them all the time. And like the minute they're like, "Eh, I don't want to let them, let them go. Stop, (laughs) stop, let them stop. I never wanted to be famous. And any kid that comes and is like, I want to be famous. I'm like, good luck. (laughs) Yeah. Be a famous business person. (laughs) Like what? (laughs) Yeah. Well, that's what we actually, because we had Richard Dumont on the show last week. And that's what we spoke about with him. And it's interesting to see, you know, the similarities with you both in that, like in your intention, it was never to seek fame or notoriety. It's just like, you love what you do and you've found this path and you'll do whatever comes your way with just the intention of working and enjoying the work. And it's not to another level of fame. It's just to work and enjoy the craft of it and enjoy the craft of it. And to try to, for me, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit just because now I'm, I'm so lucky to be in the position of, of being a director for voice work and a a coach for people. I'm, I'm, I just want what I didn't have. I want to provide what I didn't have. I want to be the nurturing mama, um, you know, emotional support system yeah. for anybody who's trying to navigate what being creative and in an industry might mean, you know, I want to, I want to strive to, yeah, just, just leave it a bit different than when I came into it and, and hopefully have integrity while I do it. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm super into busting down gatekeeping practice. Like I really am nice. interested in, and you know, I try my best and I, who knows like what that even means, but I, I try all the time to just be like, can we get more people in? Can we, can we teach? Can there be more? <laughs> like yeah. there's room for everyone. Let's have some more. Let's have some different. Let's have some new, like more new, new anyway. But yeah, it wasn't ever about fame. It was about being respected enough to have, a long, long career doing something that isn't somebody telling me what to do with my life or time or owning my time or, you know, it's, it's to have freedom. It's a terrifying path, especially as I navigate 
my forties, I'm like, Whoa, <laughs> what am I doing? But, but I, I, I choose, I choose uh, freedom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To a certain extent, obviously we all work in an industry that's not free at all, but yeah. <laughs> you, choose, you know, the, I guess the way you experience the freedom is different, right? It's, uh, there's flexibility and whatever. So I get it in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. There's flexibility. You make your own schedule. You choose what you want to do or not do. And I I mean, I was going to say that after university, that's exactly the sort of conundrum that I was in when I graduated with this piece of paper that meant nothing and provided very little. And I, I was not booking any kinds of auditions. I was still doing voice work and, and and again, I say voice work, but back then in like 2001, 2002, three, four, like video games were just starting to be something. So there wasn't the, the major thing that it is now. And I was, I was doing video games already. I had a, yeah. found a pay stub a few months ago from 1999. Wow. So, yeah. I had done some stuff. Like I was there watching it happen, but I was very, um, disillusioned by all of it, by showbiz, by academia. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And, uh, I found myself really questioning what I wanted to do. Did I even want to be in showbiz anymore? Right. And, and burlesque, that's a big part of your life. When did you discover that? And how did that come to practice from being a right. voice artist so right at that potential time. poet <laughs> yeah you know but that's oh, but that's man. what you said freedom that's what I'm everything I hear in you is like freedom I want to explore like you said I'm a seeker I just yeah. want to try different things and reinvent myself you know mm-hmm. every time in different ways and it's amazing that's it. What that's life. what I did. Yeah. I don't know where the Phoenix optimism energy comes from, you know, mm. like I there's a, there were a lot of fraught moments in my young life, but yeah, I, we went traveling my, my ex, uh, and I went traveling after university, the classic thing that was, I was going to say like, that was probably the longest break I took from acting in 2001. I went on a six month long wow. you know, travel, travel journey, Beautiful. which was, it was beautiful, except we left oh. Uh, in September, uh, 2001. So nine 11 happened, uh, right. 11, 11 days into our worldwide travel extravaganza with 15 flights booked. And, uh, we navigated nine 11 from overseas for the entirety of our trip. And wow, it was really strange to be not in North America for that because we weren't exposed the same way people here were like, I didn't see so much of the footage really until I got back like the next year when they started doing memorials and I like, I'm hypersensitive to visuals and sound. So I, I, it was, I mean, it's horrendous. It's It's horrendous. It's horrendous. Um, but we weren't experiencing that in 2001, you were getting a little bit at internet cafes, you were seeing certain things, but it wasn't the bombardment Mm -hmm. of American media, but it was also deeply confusing. Um, and to be navigating all these airports and like people with machine guns, I'd never seen a machine gun in my life. And like everywhere we went, there was just like weird security and the security systems, like there was no cohesion and there was just fear, all the, and weird fear, fear. fear, And then also no fear. Cause people in Thailand were like, you know, but then in Thailand, like, we were in Bali and then there was that big bombing in Bali on, on a beach, like three days after we left Bali. So I was just, I was consumed with this anxiety and I ended up getting a diagnosable anxiety condition with flying after that. When I got back to Montreal, I was like, let's, let's just do acting. And then, yeah, then there was like a series of terrible things. Like I came back, we, you know, we kept going in the relationship and it was like, you know, we were in our twenties and it was that relationship that needs to end because we loved each other, but we needed to grow. And so that happened. And then we lost, um, uh, a very cherished member of our voice community, Jacqueline Lenetsky, um, yes. in 2003. Uh, and that was, horrifying as well like that was yeah. you know going to I, set she was in my high school I went to high school yeah 
Yeah. So we lost her and we lost Vadim Schneider. And that was extremely, it was like a lot of wake up calls starting in 2001. You know, I was like, oh, the world is scary. Oh, oh, you can die. And then, you know, of course, inevitably I broke up with my boyfriend and it put me in a tailspin because I was two years out of university. I wasn't booking acting gigs. And I was being told uh, constantly at casting calls that I was too fat explicitly told too fat, too fat, you know, and I, I don't know how much I weighed, but I was small, (laughs) you know, I was curvy. I was in my twenties, but I was like a small, I was a small person. I was like maybe a size 10 for my five foot one frame. Like I was told I was obese. I was, I was offered Tracy Turnblad hairspray audition. Like I am, you know, I was being offered like roles for morbidly obese people being like 140 pounds, you know, being a size eight or 10, like, oh my God. Uh, yeah, bombarded with this message of you're fat, you're fat, you're fat, you're fat, you're fat. Um, so yeah, like I became depressed. I became anxious. I became bulimic. I became really messed up in my brain. And um, I, I lost sight of having you know, the freedom of, of still getting to do dubbing. And I still had my dubbing family. And I, I don't know if I ever really knew until later, like how lucky I was to just get scooped up again and to still be able to have a gig. But, you know, I, I had bartending jobs and I worked in cafes and I worked in the service industry and in, in retail. And I, I knew that something was missing and then I got really depressed and I just sort of stayed in bed for a couple of months, um, in 2004. And my mom was like, let's go see this documentary at the film festival. And it was about burlesque and it was by, uh, the late Linda Lee Tracy and it was called anatomy of burlesque. And it was this amazing overview of what burlesque was and neo-burlesque that had started reviving in the late 90s, even earlier in some places, but like burlesque. And then I realized, oh, it's what I already knew from musical theater. It's chorus girls in little corsets and, and seamed dance tights and kick lines and it's uh, singing in the rain. It's what Debbie Reynolds was like. That's a borderline of what burlesque and vaudeville was like it was literally in singing in the rain like their rise through vaudeville vaudeville and burlesque and then i realized like what it was in the 90s and the early 2000s it was feminism it was freedom of expression it was sensual and it was brazen and hey look at that body and hey look at that body and those bodies unapologetic it was like i know strength Yeah. And it was very DIY in the early 2000s as well. So I was like, shit, I need to do that. I'm doing that. And I didn't know what that meant. So I basically glommed on to some of the people that were in the documentary. And I said, okay, I'm going to go and find Dixie Evans, this crackerjack, old, older lady with white, white hair and a gown showing us around this weird goat farm museum in the middle of the <laughs> desert somewhere in California. And I was wow. like, what's, that? what's going on? So I bought all these books. I went, I went full academia. I was like, okay, I'm going to become a burlesque story and I'm going to just do it. And I told myself, all right, I'm going to write a burlesque play. I don't know what that means. So I applied for the fringe. I got in, I was like, shit, I guess I'm writing a burlesque play. <laughs> and my parents, my mom and my stepdad, um, had at that point gotten a music gig out in Las Vegas. So I was lucky enough to be able to go and visit them uh, kind of whenever I wanted. So I started spending more time in Las Vegas, which was weird, but it was my little <laughs> gateway drug to burlesque because there were great vintage shops in Las Vegas in 2004, 2005. So I raided vintage shops, you know, with the money that I, (laughs) and let me just say, I'm a very privileged person. I had access to the money that I made as a child, but when I was 18, I stupidly petulantly demanded access to my money was not given the tools to manage my money correctly. Or if I had the tools, I ignored them resoundingly. And I blew through my whole everything. Oh yeah. I blew at 18. I bet like, Oh my God. Anybody would Holly. That's like, you know, it's like, what do I want? Yeah. (laughs) And I, I mean, I, I, I know people will say, Oh, well, you're just stupid. And and yes, I was, I was very stupid. I was 18, 19, all through my early twenties, but I used all that money to fund myself. I was like, well, if I, this money is to fund me, 
I'm going to fund this burlesque thing. So yeah, I bought up all these books. I bought up all these costumes. I, I produced, I self-produced, uh, wrote, co-directed, co-choreographed, um, and sold solo funded the whole costumes of all of these people. And I, I made a troupe <laughs> after I got back and we put on a show in 2005 at the fringe. Um, and I taught everybody, but, but I went, I went on a pilgrimage and I found Dixie Evans and I, I did the whole fake it till you make it thing. I just like, I rented a car in Vegas and I drove to Hellendale, California to this goat farm in the middle of nowhere through death Valley all by myself. Like, and I went to her and I said, I'm a burlesque dancer. I'd never set foot on a stage doing burlesque in my life. At that point, I'd done millions of dance shows, but like yeah. I had not stripped yet. And, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a family. Like I, I was going to say it's a sisterhood, but it's not just gendered anymore that way. Like it is a, it is a family. It's a, it's a, an amazing kind of team world village of people who are different and who lie and say like, I'm this. And then they say, yeah, okay, sure. You're that. She was so welcoming. And she said, yeah, send me your stuff. And I never did. Cause I was intimidated. And, but yeah, I brought all that knowledge and those books back to Montreal. And I, we wrote the fringe play. We did the fringe play. We did it at a uh, main hall, a venue that has since uh, been long gone, you know, up on Saint Laurent somewhere. And, you know, we charged six bucks and it's a lot of boobies. And we did this weird, I did a weird little like vaudevillian burly cue review. And I had a live band and all these musical theater people that I had met at McGill doing operettas, all those people, we kind of reconverged. And that was the beginning of this 12 year side hustle. Um, wow. Which I had no idea. I had no idea you did that. I thought you just, you know, saw it, liked it, joined a group. Like I didn't know you created <laughs> that. That was like, yeah. And there were already people yeah. here doing, doing burlesque, but they were on the French side. And there, right. there like was this just notorious divide between English and French still. Now it's all big mishmash and that's great. But like at that time it was still like, oh, they're the, the, the Franco ones and they don't want to talk to us. <laughs> so we were like, we're okay. <laughs> we'll just do our own burlesque. And then I met, you know, I met people who were like, well, we were doing it in the nineties in Montreal, but because we were, you know, doing sex work as well, we weren't like, it was different and we were shunned from, and then, you know, burlesque has changed so much in the 12 years that I was doing it in the eight years that I took a hiatus. And now that I'm coming back into doing burlesque in small scale steps, oh my God, it's different. It's so different. And I need, it needed to be different. Um, but yeah, like I was, I navigated a lot of experiences thanks to burlesque because of burlesque. I got back into being able to audition for film and, and TV because I got, you know, I used the pigeonholing at that point. I was, they were like, Hey, curvy, sexy. And I was like, yup. Um, <laughs> so, so it gave I you confidence. It gave me confidence to not feel humiliated when I was still being considered the fat, sexy girl or the fat, funny girl, or, mm -hmm. you know, it, it set me up for just knowing that if I'm ever at a crossroads, then I've got a I've got to think about what I really want to do. And then I've just got to do something with it. I've just got to go and I've got to like do it yeah. um, myself all the time. Um, you know, and I, again, I've amassed a lot of experiences because I made a lot of mistakes. Um, so I'll never, <laughs> I'll never say that it was easy or perfect or um, fun the whole time, but it was incredible. And I was, yeah. I mean, I traveled yeah. all over the world. I went, I performed in Chicago and New York and Tokyo twice. And it was, um, oh. it was wild. Yeah. And so, yeah, that was, that was burlesque for 12 years. And then I left it for eight years and I missed it. And I was still doing, you know, film and TV and, and voice work, got married, divorced, then the pandemic happened. It's, it's been a weird time. <laughs> now I'm yeah, back. Yeah, lots and, gone, ha lots yeah. Yeah. happened. And now I'm back to burlesque. So really yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's very cool. It's a oh, very, cool. I had no idea. I had no yeah. idea. Yeah. Most people didn't. And it's funny because most people, when I started doing burlesque and I was mentioned, you know, a lot, I was in the Gazette all the time and like things, people were like, Oh, you're famous. And I was like, I'm famous. I'm Montreal famous. <laughs> and what does that mean? And 
But what I found the most offensive was a lot of the time journalists or people would be like, so, you know, you just started? And I'd be like, no, man, <laughs> like yeah. my whole life, you know? And so when you read these stories or you hear these interviews and podcasts with people who are like, it's not overnight. <laughs> there's no such thing as overnight success. Like there's just navigating the ebbs and flows. And if you can stick with it, oh, then suddenly you're hot and famous, but like you've been doing it for 20 years, you know? Yeah. I've been doing this for 35 years. There's no overnight anything. <laughs> There's no overnight anything. And it, that's what I find. It's like, if you stick with it, you'll be hot, especially in Montreal. Like, I, but I think anywhere you're hot for a moment, but then you'll not be hot again <laughs> a couple no. of years later and you'll stick with it. And guess what? You'll be hot again. And it's like, yeah, it, that's just what it is. It's ups and downs. That just, yeah. that's just what it is. And sometimes the downs can be long. Yeah. And especially crushing. the build up and crush and crushing. Cause you yeah. still, but at, at your age now, you do you find it a little bit easier that than you did 20 years ago? Cause don't you kind of know it's going to come back now? Yeah. I mean, I still do the panic, uh, say yes to mm -hmm. everything that comes my way, become overscheduled okay. and veer over towards burnout. But I, <laughs> I'm better at that now. I have right. more self-care practices that makes me realize, yes, there will be more. Or if there's no more, I can pivot. I know I can pivot. I'm I'm not averse to getting, you know, extra jobs, doing other things. I have yeah. like, I have no problem. I mean, maybe not bar stuff because I can't I can't stay up late. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, I can't stay outside like eight. Even doing burlesque, going back to it now, I'm like, let's. The show's at what time? It's at nine. No. Yeah. But but you know, I'll work in retail. I'll do what I have to do. I'll I'll I do private coaching, but I I all I also find that that's draining. So I have to make sure I don't take on too many private clients. And yeah, um, yeah. Anyway, but yeah, I I I certainly know that it's not the end of the world. But I've I've experienced many many dips. I did a gig. I did a stint at, at the National uh, Arts Center. I did it. I did a play. I did two plays, and I was the lead of one of the plays. And then I did a musical in the other play. And that was 2011. And I came back. I was three months away. Three months in Ottawa. <laughs> People were like, I don't know where you were. I didn't know you were gone. And I lost all these gigs. And then my phone did not ring for anything. No voice work. No nothing. For six months. Yeah. And I had come back thinking, yes, I was the lead in a play in yeah. Canada, the yeah. national. Uh, and I, man, what an ego trip. <laughs> like, nope, <laughs> no, no, you're not. That's nothing. So I, I recorded some jazzy peas that I paid for, I, you know, funded again. I funded this project to record some singing stuff. And I, I started hustling at, you know, hotels and I got a band together and I did those gigs and I went back to burlesque and I, you know, hustled it up some more, but I, yeah, like you got to hustle. And if you're not into the hustle, then you, you got to do something else. You got to rest and then figure out what you want to do and just do it. Yeah. yeah. But it was easier for me because I was <laughs> self-funding, but also putting myself in severe debt which I'm still navigating now and like almost bankruptcy several times. Like I, I, I wasn't uh, savvy <laughs> about a lot of these choices. I just knew that I had to throw myself back into my self-generated things whenever, whenever it looked like things were going to be hairy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, like, I mean, it sounds like whenever you come back to yourself and believe in yourself and your projects is actually when you, succeed a lot and so yeah. hopefully that's like that's motivation to you know keep going and trying different things and yeah trusting yourself because but yeah I mean that's that's it and it's easier said than done because like we're artists and I don't know I mean the people pleasing is big and the not thinking you know not realizing you have a choice and not not wanting to say no, like that's all part of it and not having confidence, like just sometimes not having any physical confidence, you know, and now navigating aging and like, I'm, I'm committed to trying to be as graceful as I can in this aging process. And like, I want to advocate for, you know, all bodies, all faces, all sizes, everybody on screen, everybody on TV, everybody do the thing, please. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't, I don't want to 
look homogenized and Im immovable in my facial area, but like, it's scary. I'm, I'm, you know, I got a little weird things going <laughs> on in the face and I'm like, wow, this is happening. I'm an older lady. What the hell? <laughs> um, and yeah, I've just, I've just had to go on like the mental health journey a lot in the last 10 years. And, you know, that's, that's where the, the main faith kind of confidence DIY stuff comes in actually because it's those moments of like what am I doing and then I have to go back and be like hey look at what you did you did this you did this you survived this you you handled this you sort of almost didn't handle that but you still handled it because here you are like you're here you're here you're here you know and you're um, okay <laughs> and I'm okay and then I can and then I can talk and that's it so now like yeah, it's easier now. It's also easier to be sort of a bit out of the spotlight once in a while. Like being a director is lovely, but you're not really able to do any other stuff. Like if I'm on a if I'm on a contract for video game, I can't say yes to a lot of like film or TV, not but I do love being in the shadows and just being able to observe a lot of people who come through my studios and I can just relate to them actor to actor and and help them kind of find what it is they may not know or see or be able to access about themselves in that moment and that's like the biggest gift because i would have i i did get to experience that with certain voice directors and and other directors too but really in the weird dark room of a voice studio where i think a lot of people really just don't understand what happens in those rooms you know and it is it's real acting. Like I've heard some casting people, not you, Jess, of course, but like, I've heard some people say like, you know, you do your acting and then you do some voice work on the side. And I'm like, but that's acting. Like, it's, yeah. still, it's still acting. It's theater techniques with cinematic emotion level. Um, and like a, the technical proficiency of like, a virtuoso magician, a magician, ma musician and magician. It's a kind of magical alchemy of all these, these things. So, you know, you're being called to do something that's, that's just as real and emotive as, as a, a tour de force theater performance or a film performance, you know, um, when, when it's good. You know, for animation, it's a bit different, but it's still, you still got to believe that you're a mouse on a tricycle. And I need to know that you yeah. believe that you're that mouse. Like, I don't need you to just make the sound of a mouse on a tricycle. I need you to be the mouse. <laughs> so I think um, being in dubbing and being in, in video games and doing voice work direction is, is a real fun opportunity to sort of coach people in their, in their acting. Cause yeah. it's, like it's, it's a physical endeavor and it's, it's intention and imagery and it's like, it's a whole other realm. And I do, I do hope that, I mean, there's no real way to get recognition for it, but it is something that's very, very valuable. Even if it's something that you don't love doing, like it's a valuable tool to, to help spur you for the things that you do want to do, whether it's theater or film, TV, whatever. Yeah. Do you have a favorite? Cause I mean, you do so much, you know, is there a thing that's like gives you the most juice type thing or. I mean, I love the day. It depends on the day. Yeah. It depends <laughs> on the day. Like I love, love doing cartoons. I just love doing. Yeah. In cartoons and it, and it isn't always even, you know, little high pitched voices, which is sort of my wheelhouse or, 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 you know, little kitty voices. And admittedly, like we do need kids because there's lots of kids who are doing their own kid voices in videos, uh, in cartoons now, and we need them. <laughs> yeah. They've put me out of a job, um, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, I love that. That's so whimsical and, and it's sometimes it's so absurd and so maniacal and, uh, but no more. I mean, yeah, again, like it really does depend on the day. If I don't have the juice to do those kinds of output um, sessions as an actor. Yeah, I really I really welcome those moments. And again, it's it's still juice. It's still a lot of zhuzh and energy expended yeah. to direct. But I can exercise a different part of the muscle. And uh, 
and that balance has really become quite has become quite valuable for me. Um, Cause yeah, I give, I overgive. I'm a, I'm an overgiving people pleaser. Like me, like me, like me laugh, please laugh, please yeah. laugh. You know, like it's a whole, it's been a whole journey through that. Um, and she's, you know, she's in there, but I, I know that I can like give her an Ativan and put her to bed for a while. <laughs> Not that I take Ativan, but I metaphorically give the character an send her away. I can't do, I can't do anything like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but did you go out and seek being a director or was it where you asked like or is it something that you pursued uh, also like knowing that something you would also want to I do? I started asking in my 20s and 30s like if it was something that I could do and I was dissuaded um cuz there was you know well, the kind of a system in place where people were doing it and that's what they wanted to do and they wanted to do it and they all did it and that's where the money was and they did it and they held on to the money and they stayed right. and they did it <laughs> and they said oh no they diverted um and then when uh some of the studios realized that um the behemoth of Netflix was coming our way noticing that Montreal had a huge amount for, for Canada and for North America of dubbers that had some kind of system in place. They, they turned their eye of Sauron on us and said, Ooh, what, what do we have here? You know? And then certain executives um, gave me a shot and asked me what I thought and asked me what was needed uh, to create a, um, a new landscape and asked me and a bunch of other people in the industry, but it was, it was wonderful because wow, someone was asking me for my knowledge and my expertise. And I found that very, uh, uh, it was amazing. It was amazing. And so, yeah, I was, I was sort of asked, I had asked, I had put myself out there and, and, you know, we, we all together kind of recalibrated the landscape. Netflix came along and yeah, then they realized like, hey, we don't have good diversity here. So let's mm. get some more diversity here. And we were, I was very lucky to be part of that discussion. And uh, yeah, now we have a very diverse and, and different kind of landscape uh, with lots of women and men and lots of different people kind of involved. And, and now more and more training mechanisms in place. Because again, I was brought up in a system that was, if you knew, you knew, if someone knew you, they would call you up. There were no auditions for dubbing. Very rarely right. were there auditions for dubbing unless you were a kid and nobody knew you or unless you're somebody nobody knows. Like, and now like, you know, we all know what the plight of auditioning is now with self tapes and stuff. You can't self tape for a dubbing audition. You need to be in the room. Yeah. And so it's on the onus is on the director to bring new people into the room. And that's what needs to happen. And that's what started happening because Netflix is like, we don't want to see the same 20 names over and over. That's yeah. not what we want. We want diversity on our, on our content, you know? Yeah. And uh, so very happy that they came here. Uh, but yeah, it's provided at least in dubbing a huge rebirth and a huge income spike for, for actor members um, and the industry in general. Like, yeah. And it's new. So yeah, I'm just happy to have been part of that journey and I'm happy to be part of the conversation and I'm happy to, I'm happy to cede my spot when it's time. I'm not, I'm not uh, averse to saying that, you know, and that, that's scary, like, but like I'm an artist and I'm committed to making sure that it's different from when I got here and it's already different now and I want it, it to be is. more different. And when I leave, like, please somebody take my spot. Like right. when I when I left Burlesque, I started to realize like I'm not the body that needs to be seen. Like there needs to be a different kind of body happening, you know, because I was a pretty regular looking person in the burlesque scheme. And I wanted there to be more diversity and less homogeneity and less tokenizing and things like that. And like, that's still happening at burlesque. Burlesque is still a little hotbed. It's always a microcosm of other artistic milieus. Like we're all just kind of navigating that. Um, yeah. and I don't want to take up a spot that, you know, would be better served by someone else in my spot. But anyway, that's, that's, that's sort of like future down the line. Like I, yeah. I'd, I'd like to be writing. I think, I think 
I've been ignoring it for a while and I'm like, mm, it's like, I'm going to have to write soon. Cause I feel like <laughs> kind of creeping. that's great. Well, listen, it was creeping when you were uh, Miguel, <laughs> it was creeping when you were 20 and, and, yeah. uh, you know, oh, I, so I have journals from when I was a little child. I have my little, like, <laughs> like, like just, I have all my stuff. Yeah. I was always a, a storyteller, weirdo kind of writer person, I think. Um, and yeah, like I, I do, I love, thank you for having me because it's nice to be able to just say my weird story. And if it it's can a great help story, yeah. One other person to other people, three, four, whatever, if it can help anybody, or at least as a cautionary tale with what, like what not to do, I'm happy to be that person <laughs> too, you know? <laughs> no, well, I think, yeah. think what's cool is that like, I think your goal is freedom. And, mm -hmm. and it sort of left you open to different opportunities. What advice do you give for young Montreal artists starting out, actors starting out? Uh, listen, be on time, yeah. uh, observe, but ask questions and advocate for yourself. Nice. Take charge of the space. Obviously, if you're coming into a dubbing studio, you just, you know, do, do all the things that are bare minimum, like don't show up late to your gig or your call. Or if you've asked to audit, show up five minutes early, be respectful of the room, gauge the room, ask where you can put yourself. Don't make noise. Don't wear something shifty that, you know, and watch and like take notes, um, observe, be, be a sponge, beginner's mind, beginner's mind, beginner's mind. I'm a be I agree. I think that's a great note. <laughs> well, my last question, which I love ending with, what are the big goals, dreams for Holly now? Looking forward, what's on mm. the plate? I want to write stuff that I Amazing. can be in. Somebody said to me, I think it was Bill Rowett, who is a lovely, lovely person and creator. And, and a, I don't know if you've gotten the chance to talk to him, but he's an incredible soul. Um, he said when I started doing voice directing, cause I only started doing voice directing in 2019. Let's just wow. be real here. I, I, I started during the pandemic. Um, and he said, well, why don't you direct, you know, you can direct some other stuff. And I, I was like, what? Cause he asked me to direct some, some visual, some TV thing, some short thing. And I said, just because you do voice directing doesn't mean you only have to do voice directing, you right? Direct whatever you want. And it felt very, again, I feel like an imposter. I didn't do film school. I didn't do TV anything. I barely have a track record on camera. Like I have a decent resume, but I don't, I haven't been in that milieu, but I do love watching the directors, you know? So, Hey, maybe I can direct something. Mm. Wow. That's a nice book. <laughs> so again. I'm going to write something, maybe direct something. I'd like to keep I'd like to keep uh, teaching. I'd like to come up with like an online course that people could do. That's a goal yeah. that I've had for a while, just because I do get so tired and I want people <laughs> to be able to have access. And I, I want to do a little less killing myself. <laughs> so, so things like that, like just more self-generated um, stuff that can keep me feeling like I'm in line with my creativity. And music. I do music on the side. So hopefully more of that just for fun. <laughs> wow. That's amazing, Holly. Well, amazing. thank you so much for sharing and, and sharing your journey with us. It's a, yeah, I learned a lot and I thought I knew you. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So thank you for that. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you yeah. both. Thanks for all the work that you do in this city and in, in our community. Yeah. Uh, you're helping to change the landscape. We love our podcasts and we want to highlight Montreal talent. So I, and we enjoy awesome. doing it. We, it's also kind of secretly fun because I get to like see people who I don't see that often. So it's I fun. Know. You know, I was like, just, can we book this person? I want to see them, you know, and <laughs> it's great. Yeah, so, it's, yeah really it's fun. So for today's takeaways, one, training is a privilege. Two, if it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Three, advocate for yourself. And four, keep a beginner's mind keep learning. Thanks everybody. And Thank have a great you. week. Bye. Bye. If you're enjoying this podcast, we would really appreciate it. If you could take a moment to support us, leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. You can share this podcast with your friends and colleagues and follow us on social media at book the room podcast. We put out episodes weekly. So subscribe to the shows to get notified.